Stay tuned as On Call Television looks at the history of medicine in South Dakota. Funding for On Call Television is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. From the traditional medicine wheel of the Plains Indians to the horse and buggy of the country dock to the high-tech world of modern care, we look at the history of medicine in South Dakota. The doctors are on call tonight. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight's show is about the history of medicine in this prairie region in South Dakota, in the Americas, or in the world. The European explorers and trappers about 500 years ago were not the first to practice medicine on the plains of North America. It started, of course, with what we think were the original inhabitants of the region during the Paleo-Indian period some 10 to 13,000 years ago as the glaciers receded and the nomadic caribou and mammoth hunters left relics and spear points for us to find. We are left only guessing what level of medical knowledge they had to tend to their birthing, their babies, their injured, and their aging ill. Later, the woodland culture evolved. According to Dr. Jack Brink of the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton, Alberta, there is evidence dating as far back as 4,000 years of rocks astronomically correctly placed into wheels on the prairie with carns or rock piles in the center around these medical medicine wheels we can imagine the shaman and medicine men and women performing rituals that included dance and song calling for spiritual assistance to ensure a successful hunt tell when the clan should head to the winter grounds or heal someone dying from pneumonia the more recent american indian tribes of the area maintain strong traditions, medicine, medicinal herbs, even sweat lodges that cleanse the body of spiritual illness, bringing spiritual and physical renewal and certainly providing warmth during chilly South Dakota weather. The evolution of medicine on the prairie moves from the native medicines through the crude surgery that was utilized during the Civil War. And then came the understanding of infection and the introduction of sterility and clean surgery, of antibiotics, and then importantly of the sharing of more standardized medical knowledge through medical schools. In South Dakota, we developed early in the 20th century a medicine, I mean a medical school that provided for the first two years of training, where the students had to transition to another school for their last two years of training. That was my experience with an education in South Dakota that had to be good enough to prepare us to go anywhere. And when I moved to Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, I found I was equally ready and in some ways better prepared than my new classmates in Atlanta. I became quite proud to be from South Dakota. The four-year degree granting medical school came in the 70s, which brought huge benefits for the people of South Dakota. Tonight we will talk of the history of medicine on the prairie and of the Americas and of the world. We'll go wherever you want or would like us to go. Your questions are so very important in directing our experts. We're 
especially prepared to talk about the medical school, but we have physicians here tonight that span a broad period of time who look forward to your questions about the changes that have occurred through these more recent years as well. Uh, hello, my name is Carl Wagner. I'm a, a, a retired physician. I was born and raised in Pierre, Pierre, South Dakota, and uh, uh, grew up there and went off to uh, Yale University in Connecticut uh, for my undergraduate uh, education. When I received a BA, I was uh, within 15 minutes sworn into the Marine Corps for the next several years. and. Uh, uh, when as soon as I got out after the uh, uh, Korea was over, they were, there was a surplus of Marine officers, and if you'd been accepted into a graduate school, you could put in for an early discharge, which I did. So I uh, have uh, uh, was discharged just barely in time to uh, get, apply to medical schools. Uh, I didn't make it into USD. Uh, then I I went uh, was accepted at uh, Yale where I'd go, gone to school and and uh, immediately and I applied to Harvard and they accepted me immediately too. So as uh, soon as I got discharged, uh, uh, an hour later I was down at uh, from Camp Pendleton down to San Diego and on a on a uh, an airplane that night one of the one of the old red eyes got into Boston early the next morning got a cab to medical school and went across the street and my first class was already going on. <laughs> I finished at Harvard, took internship and residency, then. Uh, I uh, wondered where, what, what to do next. I had a, an appointment to stay on at uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital where I'd had internship and residency training. And uh, thought that had a, with that commitment, I thought I would just stay there for a while. But one, one day the phone began to ring from South Dakota from the old Sioux Valley Hospital offering me the job as chief of pathology. I talked a lot to my wife about it and we finally decided we'd come back to the Midwest. So we did, and I arrived in Sioux Falls, I think, in June of 1962, and I've uh, been there ever since. I uh, was always interested in the medical school and had a part-time appointment on the fa faculty. I wasn't uh, not a, a formal appointment in the sense that I was on a salary, but I welcomed the opportunity to spend time teaching students. We'd already started a four-year pathology residency at our, in our group as we were growing. I was the first man there, but then I was joined by other friends from Boston, uh, two from Harvard, and and. Uh, I was there for many years and gradually became more and more involved with the medical school. And uh, ultimately, I think in the summer of 1963, I was asked if I'd accept the dean's job. I didn't apply. <laughs> <laughs> so that came and then ever since then, I've been with uh, part, I have a little connection with the, with the medical school and a connection with uh, what turned out to be Sanford Hospital. Uh, uh, I was dean of the medical school for a few years, uh, uh, almost seven, six and a half years or so, and found that very interesting and very satisfying and, and uh, loved it. Hello, my name is Mary Nettleman. I'm dean at the University of South Dakota Sanford School of Medicine. I grew up in Michigan, and in fact, I stayed in Michigan for my youth in a small town. I grew up in a small town. My father was a family practitioner in a small town. Then I moved away and went to college, to medical school. I went to medical school at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I did a residency in internal medicine, which is adult medicine, and a fellowship in infectious diseases, both of them at Indiana University. And then my career has taken me to, oh, three or four different places. I was uh, on the faculty at the University of Iowa. I was a division chief for primary care at Virginia Commonwealth University and also associate dean there. And most recently, I was at Michigan State University where I was chair of the Department of Medicine. In 2012, I came to the University of South Dakota Sanford School of Medicine to become the dean of medicine. My specialty, as I said, is infectious diseases. I still practice. I see patients uh, in the adult cystic fibrosis clinic. And also, I do a little bit of infectious diseases consultation. So my interest in tonight's topic is really the recent history of the School of Medicine. This is a fabulous School of Medicine for the state of South Dakota. And that's my interest. Um, so tonight's topic is the history of medicine. It's great to have you here. Thanks. Um, well, this is your show tonight. 
please call in any questions or comments you might have or are curious to know about the medical school or about the history of medicine in more recent years or try us about the, his the distant past or the history of medical school in Europe or come on, we need your question. Call 1-888-376-6225 or you can submit them to oncalltelevision.com and click on the questions button. Well, we had had some prepared things that, of course, just didn't work out, so we kind of ad-libbed them a little bit. Okay. Did I miss anything, Mary, about your experience? Oh, no, I don't think you missed anything, except that it's, it's been such a wonderful experience to be in South Dakota. I want a bumper sticker that says, I'm not from South Dakota, but I got here as soon as I could. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and really, you know, it's been a, just a marvelous experience. Um, and your dad was a primary care doctor? My dad was a family medicine physician. Um, in, uh, he was in World War II, and so he went to medical school after World War II and started a practice in a uh, small town in Michigan. My town made it up to 9,000 people when I was uh, young. I think it's still at 9,000 people. That's right. And I grew up working in his office and uh, also, uh, you know, helping. We'd, we'd go to the hospital with him and all that sort of stuff. You were a so. DK, as they say. You know. Yes, I was. A doctor's, a doctor's kid. kid. Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. De indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Were you a doctor's kid? Not at all. No, 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 nobody in the family. So what in the world drew you into going into, in, into medicine? I went off to college and got, got interested at that time. You were at Yale? Yes, yes. So I what was had it? I a scholarship it, it, there and, and uh, got to know some of the pre-meds. My roommate for four years was a pre-med for many years, uh, uh, chair of uh, neurology at Ohio State. Oh, so he went on and he became the chair of neurology? Oh, yes. Oh, that's yes, interesting. Yes, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Is he still alive? Very much so. So you He's still at Ohio with. State. I'll be seeing him next week. Yeah. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So um, we're talking about things in South Dakota, and uh, Carl, you talked about this book, The Log House Was Home. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about mm -hmm. that. I brought this because Dr. Riggs, Dr. Theodore Riggs, is an old and good friend of the family, but very well known in the central part of South Dakota. He, his parents uh, and grandparents were both uh, 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 missionaries, early missionaries. and They were uh, doing missionary work in Pier? Uh, yes, just outside of Pier, across the river in uh, 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 one of the bottoms there. But then they came across and basically founded o Oahe. And they built a church there and a school and... and uh, there was a town uh, called Oahe. There was just a little little village with, uh, with lots of... Uh, 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 American Indians. American Indians, yeah. Yeah, is, is it underwater now? Uh, the house is mostly underwater, I understand. I haven't been out there for years. Yeah. So, th th and this, so he, he was in what era? He was born in 1873. And, uh, and he practiced from? He practiced up through, I think, about 1960. He was uh, quite, quite elderly, but still going strong and known, known all over the, that part of South Dakota. He, uh, the, the high school is named after Dr. Riggs, T.F. Riggs High School, where all of us went to high school. And uh, he was a good friend and, and uh, a good, he was a president of the State Medical Association and boarded in several different categories. And he came back there as, uh, as uh, uh, when, even when he was a medical student and went off on house calls and went on one with, a, with a, a horse, a couple of horses by himself that was 50 miles. Had to cross two rivers. <laughs> wow. So that was uh, kind of uh, medicine delivered uh, by horse yes. and uh -huh. buggy. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. horse yeah, and buggy. And, and I bet they practiced it a lot differently back then, not having all sorts of medications. Yes, but the same, uh, he, was, he graduated, I think with honors, he graduated from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins. And, uh, so not adult thought. So, so Not a dull thought. No, no, no. <laughs> and uh, uh, he uh, went over then to Europe, to Heidelberg and to uh, 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 Berlin, and uh, had several years of additional training, and uh, then came back to uh, uh, South Dakota. I think he was in Baltimore for a couple more years after he came back, and then came back home permanently, My spent goodness. the rest of his life there, a remarkable gentleman. I, 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 had, I had no idea about him. I mean, I knew the, of the high school's name. Mm -hmm. He knew how to, to speak uh, 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 Dakota before English. Oh, 
because he was raised uh, by yes. missionaries. Yes. Uh -huh. So he had a, a, a desire to come back. So he lived in the town of Oahe. There was no, not a town. When he came back to practice, he lived in Pierre. But the Oahe institution, the school out there, continued for many years until they put in the dams, and then the, now it's underwater. Fascinating stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we hear about all these stories of uh, people, uh, doctors, uh, delivering babies in kitchen tables and, and doing surgeries right. and so on. I mean, did he, did he speak to that in that book? All of his surgery he was being done on kitchen tables or dining room tables, but what amazed me is that he was also doing an occasional laminectomy out on the ground. Uh, Which is a back surgery. He'd go out on his horse and find the patient and do a laminectomy on the ground. That to me is... On the ground? Yes. While he was laying there on the ground. Yes. Afraid to move the patient. Yes. Um, because too he had a spinal too fearful injury. to move yeah. the patient, lest there be permanent damage. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> imagine Isn't that, that amazing? Uh -huh. Well, I wonder how many of them lived, though, is the only thing I would... <laughs> <laughs> but he was so advanced that Pierre even had a little uh, PD, uh, 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 residency of its own. He knew so many people who were so famous in medicine, like the, the, the two uh, Mayo brothers would come over periodically and spend time there. And uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Lindy T. Uh, Theodore, Theodore, I think Lindy, who wrote the great book on gynecology, he used to come out on a regular basis. When we finally got a hospital, I think in 1909 or so, then he instituted a one-year residency program where, where residents would come out mostly from Hopkins and spend a year at St. Mary's Hospital in Pierre. <laughs> Isn't that re remarkable? That's, that's <laughs> remarkable. My producer says, tell them what a laminectomy is. Well, that, that's perhaps Mary, you It's a spinal surgery. Yeah. It relieves the pressure on the spine, basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's what the idea of the surgery is. Right. So your dad was doing that a little bit later. Yes, not necessarily laminectomies, but, but uh, yeah, yeah, he did, so he did uh, a fair amount of casts and also assisted at orthopedic surgeries regularly. He did surgeries. For him, though, he had anesthesia, and, and I'm sure Dr. Riggs didn't have much, but my father had ether, mm -hmm. which is different than what we have today. And it would be you put a cone on a patient's ma mouth and you drip ether in it. Now, the problem is the patient then inhales the fumes, so do the doctors. Yeah. And so does everybody else. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, he would come home reeking of either uh, because, you know, you'd be in the OR and that'd be what would happen. And yeah. so, uh, but it, it worked. And, and interestingly, um, just uh, uh, last weekend, we were um, speaking with uh, Dr. Phil Gross, who is a USD graduate of the two-year school. Um, he was an orthopedic surgeon. He was the first to do uh, hip replacement surgery in um, South Dakota, mm -hmm. and he went to Germany to learn how to do it. Yes. Uh -huh. um, many years ago, and of course, his wife Joe uh, instrumental in find, funding the founding the banquet in uh, Sioux Falls as well. Oh so, wow! Yeah, yeah. And, but he that. took what he did, his 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 you know money from orthopedic surgery and everything, and he helped to fund a clinic in the Himalayas. I mean, the amount of altruism in South Dakota, um, the ability to reach out to famous people and bring it all back to the people who need it, I think is, is really remarkable. Well, I, some would say, well, you don't live in South Dakota for fame or money. Right. You know, if you were looking for fame or money, you'd be somewhere else. You're right. doing it because the, you love the people, you love the place. Yes, Phil Dr. Gross was a friend, a, a good friend at Boy State. Oh, you went to Boy State yes, with Phil. Yes, yes, uh -huh. and I yep. uh, got to know him then, and then many years later ran into him when we were both came to practice in Sioux Falls. Well, that I I hadn't I thought he was um, I you know I I didn't realize that that's interesting. I had a chance to go to Boy State. It was a great honor. I mean, uh, I was I I uh, lost my bid for counsel in the city, in the, uh -huh. the town. I mean, it was, <laughs> I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> but it was just a great honor to be involved. And it was, you know, I was voted in by some group from, sure. well, the Legion. It from was the, a great pleasure to go to Boy State. I was elected uh, governor. Were you? And then my son was elected governor. Then my daughter <laughs> was elected governor. Uh, no, isn't that a nice No, I didn't know that. Well, I story. she, of course, was at Girl State, but. Yep. <laughs> That's that's quite a that's quite a deal. That's quite a deal. So. Yeah. Well, I didn't make counsel in my town, but I went. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went. But uh, it's a great pleasure. I was thinking about the history. I had I had read a lot about the Civil War surgery that right. uh, was done, and it's interesting. They knew anesthesia. They didn't know aseptic 
technique. I mean, they knew how to put someone to sleep. They didn't know how to keep it clean. I mean, the surgeons had their knife in their boot. And their saw in their and case. their saw in, in the case. case. Yeah. And they knew that uh, if you didn't cut that off, that was such a dirty wound that it was going to uh, get infected. And so th basically they cut off limbs to save them because infection was impending. Because mm -hmm. these big, mm -hmm. huge, huge uh, balls that were, were the guns of the time would bring clothing and anything else into the wound and you know you were just destined to get infected. Well and often they were they uh, did the amputation after they already had gangrene so they didn't even save it. Some of the people didn't get saved in toward the end of the war. Um, they depended on opium, laudanum and other things and alcohol uh, for, for pain, for for pain, pain really. control while you're doing that and those things just ran out. And so it was a, a very difficult, difficult, difficult time. time. Yeah. Um, but I, I had heard that uh, despite all of that, many, many, many people uh, were saved. Yes. And that all these surgeons who had been recruited into the, the North and the South uh, carried back the anesthesia that they had learned and the techniques that they had learned about surgery and, the, and had the prowess to distribute through the United States the wonderful, the wonderful ability to do surgery. And it, it was the Civil War, as awful as it was, had that side effect to bringing health care knowledge throughout the country. Yeah, unfortunately, some advances occurred during wars. I mean, I believe the Crimean War also had advances in nursing, and uh, um, many of the wars have brought their own advances. The current war series of wars has have turned what we would have considered fatal injuries now into tra traumatic brain injuries that, and that survive missing and missing limbs. And now we're better at the the biomechanics of replacing missing limbs, but the traumatic brain injuries are a challenge for everyone. A very cha a great challenge. I want to talk about the Crimean War. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the beginning of nursing. It is. Bec uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, I don't know that I can tell you a lot about that, but it, it, it and I so I, I don't know that uh, you're probably more of an expert than I am. But it was the beginning of the profession of nursing as a, <clears throat> as a profession. Always women had helped on the battlefield. Women had gone behind the lines. This was a tradition of the Catholic Church for many, many years, the healing sisters and everything like that. But as a profession, nursing really came together around Florence Nightingale and the work that she did, and um, we still benefit from that today. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I read where uh, that it was the warm bed, the clean environment, and the food uh -huh. and the love and the caring somebody cared caring. to give you all that somebody yeah. cared yeah. that turned around the deaths i mean just remarkably right and and it was that that's the essence of nursing is that that warm place right. and cleansing and uh, well and, and and what we're doing now in the i know this is about the history but one of the things that is one of our signatures at the school of medicine now is what we call interprofessional education team based medicine so, you know, it's not, the doctor does one thing and the nurse does another and everybody else goes their own ways. It's a it's, team. It's a team sport now if you do it right. And, and if you do it right like that, not only does the patient benefit, but so does the doctor and so does the nurse. People, there's less burnout in the professions that way. Um, there's a, just a recent article called The Joy of Practice. And it underscored happy practices and what made them happy. And one of the big things was they worked as a team. It, you were part of a team. You didn't have to do it all. Um, you had ways to use your team, you, you listened to the team, the team listened to you. And that's really what we're trying to instill in people is not the history of medicine necessarily, to, but to learn from history, but to practice 21st century medicine. All right. um, that's great. Well, we're going to do this next. There was a time when medical practice may have been considered more of an art than a science. And the traveling country doctor was the artist. He painted relationships with community families and patients that were close and personable. And his healing was a focal point against the harmonious backdrop of the rural landscape. Dr. Bruce Lushbaugh, retired, talks about how medical practice today compares with that of 100 years ago. It's a privilege to be here at the Red Museum. And uh, I, I should just comment on what the pictures made me think about while we're here. And the first one is morning rounds. For him was traveling to his patients. Morning rounds for me was always to be sure to be at the hospital at least at eight o'clock so I could finish my rounds in time to be at the clinic at 10. 
So my morning rounds are just, were just a little bit different. And the house call, during my time in practice, why house calls became less frequent, but we, I think I continue to do them even maybe the last year that I practiced in 1997. We did make a lot of our house calls would be in nursing homes and uh, as well as, as the residents where somebody couldn't get to the hospital. Uh, the reason we don't make as many house calls is because there's so many things that are necessary to be done in the emergency room setting, laboratory tests and so forth. That, so we depend on an ambu ambulance service to, uh, with EMTs and paramedics to bring the patient to the hospital. It's just because medicine's become a little more science and a little less art, I guess. The office hours painting shows the country doctor's office uh, next to the bank and of course with the church in the background. This uh, makes me think of, of how I ended up in Brookings. Uh, I, I felt that uh, I could practice better medicine if I was in a multi-specialty group with, with uh, people right next down the hall from me who knew surgery or pediatrics or internal medicine. And uh, so it's at my office hours. We're in a clinic as opposed to uh, a family doctor's office. The office hours triggers the mem memory that I needed to get to the clinic, so I needed to make rounds in, in the morning and uh, to see my patients in the hospital first. And uh, I didn't want to have to go to two or three hospitals to see those patients, so that's why we chose Brookings with a, with a single hospital. And the final picture here is Wednesday afternoon. Wednesday afternoon for, for me, for most of my practice, happened to be a Friday afternoon because I was in a clinic and we need, some needed, to, the golfers took Wednesday <laughs> and uh, some of the other doctors took Thursday and I, I took Thursday for a while, but Friday was my Wednesday, Friday afternoon was my time off. The picture shows the country doctor crossing a bridge on a trout stream and heading as it says for a secluded lake, which you can't see in the, in the picture. Actually, that's what I did on my afternoons off too. We often get, went to Lake Ponset for the afternoon. These beautiful paintings bring back a lot of memories for me as well. Boy, do we owe a special thank you to the Redland Center for that. Thank you so much. And for Bruce Lushbaugh's giving us and sharing us his stories. Makes me think about Wednesday afternoon heading for the lake too. You know, we all have our afternoon off. You know, it's a stressful job and a little bit of afternoon. Sometimes you get a little afternoon in there. Probably not as a dean of the School of Medicine. <laughs> I remember Bruce very, very well as a, as a teen teenager in Sturgis. And basketball player yeah. and uh, at, at the medical school and various various uh, yes various great. conversations and friendship of many years yes I and, the, and the head of the, the state medical association the president when I was brand new at, in Brookings we had a perfect story of harmony and uh, but uh, Carl, you brought a newspaper clipping that you wanted me to read, and, and we should just kind of bounce this off. I mean, we, we, we make things look so good so many times, but people are not always happy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, certainly this is not a reflection of what we're thinking, but I want to read this, and then it will give us an opportunity to uh, respond. Uh, this was in the newspaper. It was a letter to the editor, I think the Argus. The Argus leader last week, I think Wednesday or Thursday. So thank you for bringing this to us, Carl. Healthcare system frustrating, said the person. I'm really frustrated with the health care my family is getting from the big wigs here in town. We all know the two big health care machines are here in town and that's what they are, machines grinding us through like we're some kind of factory floor instead of human beings in need of health care. What's even more frustrating to me is how quickly my children and I are stereotyped based on what medication we take, believe it or not, just because you're taking medicine, that doesn't make you some kind of unstable freak 
If I hold down a good job, my children make A's and B's in school. My husband and I own a house, we pay taxes. It just so happens though that for the past four years, my youngest son has been struggling with some kind of disease. It's been a nightmare trying to help get help for him because I'm stuck with an insurance that thinks I'm abusing their system, a healthcare machine that puts us on conveyor belts and spits us from one doctor to another who are not even willing to hardly glance at my son's blood work, much less spend more than five minutes with him. In meantime, yes, this will sound dramatic. I'm slowly watching my son waste away. Mm -hmm. You gotta feel for somebody like mm -hmm. that. Oh, she is so, he is so frustrated. And uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, there's anger because the son is not getting help. Right. The problem is sometimes no matter how good you are as a physician and, or a healthcare system, the, you don't have an answer and health deteriorates uh, and, and life is not always so good. They're frustrated with the two systems. I think we are fortunate to have two systems. Some people say it's awful, they compete, and I have said that. But I think actually it's brought, you know, it's brought some quality too. Carl, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, I was quite struck by it as poignant and, and uh, was the reason I thought of the other discussers instantly because we'd just been going through, you know, some, some uh, other materials, and that was the reason I sent it on up to you, because uh, uh, it, it's uh, probably a very relevant, uh, truthful statement. It certainly uh, reaches the heart of, of, I'm sure, all of us who are physicians. Wanting to do the right thing. Wanting to do the right thing, and the frustration that that sometimes imposes on us as individuals, but, uh, uh, I thought it was a beautiful letter. Uh, I, my sense is, and I'll throw this at you, Mary, that, um, that we could do better about uh, uh, telling our patient we care and that we could do better about having a system that allows us some time to listen. Uh, and I know you've been trying to do that. Right, and so um, there's a course we, we discussed, for example, called The Healer's Art. And um, it is a national course. Uh, and uh, all of our students, uh, we put it on. Um, we were one of the sites that put it on. And it's optional for our students, but they all take it in their <laughs> first year. And um, it's, a, it's a commitment. It's like five Tuesday nights in a row. And it's where we talk about how to communicate caring. And it's not bad to do that. Um, you need to be able to appear competent, if, yeah, but you need to be humble enough to admit that there are other people who might know more. And you also need to be able to show people that you really care. I mean, studies have actually shown that listening, you know, reflectively listening well doesn't take an hour and a half or your day or whatever. Um, so we need to be able to teach those arts. We teach them through the simulation center where we have patients debrief the students on how well they communicated. We uh, teach the students how to do their own uh, reflections so that they, we try to uh, minimize the burnout. And our revised curriculum is a, has actually been associated with significantly less student burnout and increases in empathy. But you know there is a, a system-wide issue in this. And you can find many people like this writer in, uh, in South Dakota and in the country who are frustrated with the system. And if you lined them all up, there'd probably be a, a series of frustrated doctors right behind them going, yeah, you're right. Um, and so we can change the way we express things. But there, is a, there are a lot of issues right now in medicine, and it's, it's wrong to imply that somehow it's all sweetness and light. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. It's a wonderful addition to the curriculum. I wish so much we'd had something like that when I was in school. Yeah. We all needed it. Yeah. yeah. We, we, uh, we, th and they have a new uh, uh, emphasis. There's an organization, the Golden uh, uh, Humanism. Gold Humanism Award, yes. Uh, which uh, pushes in the direction of, uh, of rewarding people who uh, show examples of, of kindness and caring. I believe, of course, I know that there's wonderful science that you use to base what you do, that, that that truth of using science drives us in the right direction, that we use the correct medicine, not too many. We use surgery when we need to. But I am, as an older physician, as I get older and older, I realize more and more the power of actually caring. A 96-year-old guy said to me one time, and I walked in, you know, and it was good to see him, and he's a great guy, and he was a friend, you know, I cared about him. <laughs> and, I, and I got done with this, you know, lots of hands on, because we have an opportunity to listen and touch 
uh, more than other people can. Yes, so can. we can touch people physically, which is a good thing. And I, you get done and you examine the guy and you say, you know, you're doing great. You're going to do great. You know, just keep walking. That's what keeps you going, you know. And, uh, and I'm walking out of the room and he says, you know, if I kept you as my doctor, I'd live forever. <laughs> <laughs> but he, beautiful. He, yes, he, did, he didn't live forever, but he lived a long, wonderful life. And I thought I might have helped him some. Uh, we have great questions. How can patients tell one professional from another? How many years of study does it take to become an RN, a lab technician, a physician, and how do you tell one professional, professional from another? It's kind of an unusual, take it. So, I think you should, that's, that's well, I'm so. The easiest thing is to look at their badge. Hmm. Um, in most places, they should be wearing a badge, um, and it should tell you who they are and what they are. The other thing is to ask. Um, and yeah, um, who are you? Well, yeah, yeah, who are you again? I'm sorry, you know, um, and you would think that you wouldn't have to ask, but uh, in the old days, in this day, I mean, you knew Dr. Riggs, it was Dr. Riggs, um, and yeah. uh, there wasn't like 20 other Riggs, Dr. Riggs yeah. and a Dr. Yeah. Riggs in training and um, Dr. Riggs, right. Riggs 25 assistants. So the easiest way is to ask. Um, there are internal conventions whereby we recognize each other. Medical students wear a short white coat, you know, residents wear a long white coat, but there are, those are traditions and pediatricians don't wear a coat because it scares the students. Yeah. Uh, it scares or the, the patient, rather. Okay. It might scare the students too, but it scares the patients. So the easiest way is to ask. If you're getting really confused about this, then you need, then the, the system should clarify it. Most places will have a, a place where they solicit your suggestions. Yeah. Um, you should do that. I mean, we found um, in my previous practice that we had to hand a piece of paper to a uh, patient and explain this is what a me this is your medical student's pictures. You know, this is what this is what a medical student is. This is your resident. This is what a resident is. This is your uh, senior physician. This is what a senior yep. physician is. Mm -hmm. um, because we have whiteboards now where we're supposed to write them up, and and we try very hard to keep those up. But it's very confusing. Medicine is so complicated that your technician runs in and out. Your you know your and phlebotomist, everybody. And too much, the doctor rotates. There is a new doctor, and then there's another doctor, and then there's another doctor. Yeah. So I think the physician should take the role of making sure, now I want you to know, I'm your infectious disease specialist. Right. And your hospitalist is this guy, and so on and so forth. And people should make the point of making it clear. Okay. And as a patient, you should say, who are you now? Who is this? Uh, who are you? Yeah. Ask that question. Yeah, exactly. I, w I walk into every room when I'm in infectious disease and I say, um, I'm Mary Nettleman again, I'm the infectious disease physician. I say that over, I say it every room I walk into, even if I've been in that room a dozen times or more. So. Okay. All right, and here's a question from Rapid City. Currently, medicine residents, uh, medical residents are working less hours than residents in the past. Yes. The med school, the residents, they, they can't work but X amount of hours per week. For the residents, yeah. Uh -huh. Does this mean residents are getting inadequate training time? Will they need increased hand, do they need increased hand on time? That's a good question. It's a very good question and, and uh, the, the questioner is quite correct. There is a limit on resident um, work hours. Now, so you go to medical school for four years, you're a doctor, but you can't practice. You've got to specialize. You've got to become a pediatrician, an obstetrician. That's what we call doing a residency. And we've got one minute, so. Okay, we're good doing residency. And so uh, the idea is that the residents have limited work hours. They can only work 80 hours a week. That's you all. Can still, yeah, that's <laughs> all, but you can still learn a whole bunch in 80 hours a hey, week. Is that enough? You and I worked uh, 100 and plus hours a well, week. There were no such uh, rules about that. No, so. but I don't know how much of it was Especially useful learning. Especially in the emergency room. Oh. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, um, and we've got one qu quick question. Tell us the title of the book Dr. Wagner uh, brought. It's called? It's called A Log House Was Home by Theodore Riggs. All right, A, A Log House Was Home. Yes. Um, and, and I don't know where you're going to find it. You're going to find it on the, in your library. Uh, yes, it, it's hard to come by now, but uh, it, it is invaluable to me. All right. He, before he printed it, he uh, said I was still in school. I forget if I was an, uh, uh, a resident or a student. Uh, he sent to me the manuscript and asked me to read the whole thing. Right. Before, yes. is that right? Before yes. he printed yeah, I'm, it? I'm yes. looking at the printing date. And, and who, who printed it? Yeah. That's the, um, it was, and it's inscribed and given to you in 1961. And it was, it's, uh, <laughs> oh, it's, and it was um, uh, copyrighted in 1961. So. Well, we're going to go to this. The best way to learn is to do. This holds true for dancers, chefs, plumbers, as well as med students. And while we might enjoy tasting uh, first 
souffle, uh, few of us would be comfortable at being a doc for the first appendectomy. To give our students the hands-on experience, the University of South Dakota Sanford School of Medicine has opened the Perry Center for Clinical Skills and Simulation on the Sioux Falls campus where students are learning with the latest technology. What brings you in today? I'm having lots of chest pain and I'm having a hard time breathing. I think we should get a doctor. Yeah. The Perry Center for Clinical Skills and Simulation is a center that uh, allows students to come here, uh, perform deliberate practice on skills or on scenarios uh, differing from heart attack scenarios to uh, any sort of abdominal pain or breathing problems, anything like that. And then we also have what's called uh, partial body trainers, and uh, those would be like a lumbar puncture trainer or a knee uh, injection, shoulder injection, uh, IV trainers, IV arms, things like that. It does start to feel real, even though you know it's a mannequin. Things are going so fast that it really does feel like it's real, as opposed to in the class where you've Down got a whole arm, group of people job. staring at you. Um, can you rate your pain for me? Eight. An eight? Okay. He's having chest pains and heart okay. time breathing. Hello, sir. My name's Brian. I'm one of the medical students here. This is Adam. Hi, sir. My name's Adam. Nice to meet you. You're having some chest pain? How long has this awesome. been going on? When, is this, when did this start? A little while ago when I was exercising. Okay. Well, looking at your EKG here, it looks like you might be having a heart attack. <laughs> cool? Cole? Cole, are you with us? Losing calories, turning blue. Cole? Okay, let's, let's drop the bed. Adam, you want to animate? Yep. Get the chest board under. Yeah, he's not moving in here. He's got a few tip on the monitor. You guys want to get epi and atropine ready? One milligram each. Does he add any nitro or aspirin? No. Okay. Okay, intubating now. Good. We're in. Okay, starting compressions. <clears throat> Adam, can you back? Pulse is 82. My function was to initially run the code. Um, to run the resuscitation of this guy that had a cardiac arrest. Um, I tried to make sure that um, communication was flowing smoothly, things were happening um, in the order that they should and when they should, and kind of keep tabs on top of everything that had gone on and what needed to happen next, and then do CPR to maintain um, circulation in this guy. Okay, let's shock him. I'm clear. Everybody clear. Shock. Okay, resuming compression. Oh, no pulses. No pulses. Resuming compressions. Let's get that epi and atropine. Let's push one milligram epi, one milligram atropine, please. One milligram epi. There is a great benefit of simulation. One of them, they can start doing some uh, clinical skills, uh, practical skills, even before they're eligible to do it on real people. For example, they can start doing IV excess intubations like the students did today during the simulated case, even before they're allowed to perform those procedures in, in real life. One milligram atropine. Atropine in? Yep. Okay. Pulse 86, Pulse 90. 90. Charge. Okay. Go get Abby. We're charging. Just wait, don't shock yet. No, I won't. <laughs> Okay, we've got a rhythm and a pulse. Cancel the shock. Alright, good. Cole, Cole, blink your eyes if you can hear us. His eyes are open. Okay, two, two placements sounds good. Peoples reactive. He's blinking, he's blinking. Sets are coming up. End scenario. Join our conversation and call in your questions, comments about tonight's topic. 
call 1-888-376-6225 or email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. Well, that's a fascinating story about that. Yes. Now, you've seen that, Carl. Have you been down to that Sim Center? Have yes, you seen yes, this? Yes, it's remarkable. Yeah, a remarkable Unbelievable. center. Unbelievable. <laughs> yep, the Perry Center after Dean Perry. Dean Perry. And, and uh, Rod, we were going to have Rod on this, uh, to give a chance for Rod to talk, but of course he's out of country. He's I enjoying retirement. Yeah, he's doing his retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so, what a great so, person. So, tell me about this uh, uh, story of the resuscitation. I mean, so, there, I mean there was. You think about it, oh, well, students learn in a book what to do, and oh, they can pass a test. But it's, as we were just saying, it's different if everybody turns to the medical student and says, doctor, your patient has no pulse, what would you like us to do? And so this is a very high stakes thing for them. Their adrenaline gets going, they react just as if this was a real patient. And we talked about suspending disbelief. Really, to them, it's a real patient. I mean, to the extent that we don't let the mannequin die, I mean, because it's, it would be very traumatic for them. And it's known to be a traumatic thing. Um, and uh, we, you could create scenarios. We, we, we teach them how to do grief counseling and everything. But, but it's really important for us that we can do it 100 times on a dummy and teach them how to do it right. Yeah. You, real people do die. And so this is an important piece. Wow. It just made me nervous going into that sim center because... <laughs> you are afraid somebody was going to you oh, know, I mean, say, I've why don't you do something? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I've been in those scenarios in that emergency room. Oh, we I didn't know. used to have emergency room doctors in our community. Right. And so I was it, you know, I'm once running, every eight days. I have also days. been the doc at the ER. You know so, how that yeah. is. Yeah, I do. And you have too. Yes, when I first came to Sioux Falls, we were all on call at the emergency room. We took our turn, every doctor on the staff. A little awkward at time for, times for a pathologist. For a pathologist. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to talk about uh, uh, learning, uh, but you know, I, I've got to call a couple questions. How much does... Sanford Medical School cost per year? How mu much debt does a student have at the end of the four years? Does the state pay for some of the education? How much it costs to educate a physician? How much is it costing the, patient, the, the doctor to? And where are we compared to other schools in the country? So the tuition um, is, it, it's in the mid 20s. Um, and tuition plus fees is in the high 20s, uh, 20 thousands um, a year. Um, we are at the 20th percentile nationally for. Um, uh, medical student tuition, so 20th, you mean 20th so 80 percent of schools charge more than we do in tuition, right? right? If you look at tuition plus fees, we're in the 30th, meaning 70 percent charge more. So we're we're very competitive at a, a price point. Our um, uh, average student debt is around 138 thousand dollars. That's what they leave medical school with, and you notice that's you know basically they're having to borrow money. Our students get scholarships. 100 percent of our students get scholarship dollars. And we are always uh, depending on the kindness of our alumni and others to help fund those scholarships. Because we draw students from families who would not normally have the wealth to generate a medical student, although I'm a doctor's daughter and everything like that. Many of our students are even the first in their family to go to college. Our school is famous for producing primary care physicians. They don't amass large amounts of wealth, you know. And, and so um, these people uh, come and, and need to take loans. And so it, it's, uh, so we do very well with our parameters, but we are always looking to improve them. So if it costs, what did you say, $30,000? A little under 30000 tuition plus fees, yeah. So uh, for uh, how much does it really cost the state or the school to, to do that? I mean, that isn't paying for it. No, um, no, tuition pays for probably a little less than half of the cost of education. So um, there is, uh, there's an existing infrastructure which you can kind of expand and contract a around. But um, we get state dollars um, that help support the medical school, that offset tuition, because uh, the, one of the primary goals of our school is to provide doctors for South Dakota, and the state is invested in that. And that's why we heavily favor South Dakota residents and people with strong South Dakota ties. Uh, and so it is South Dakota, it's South Dakota money, twice of that. Uh, yeah. It is, if you think about it, it's the South Dakota families that are producing, you know, the money for the medical student right. in and South Dakota. Yes. We get private money, too, f for uh, our medical school that, that helps supplant that. Meaning? Uh, donations what? from uh, people, individuals. Especially for scholarships. Um, and uh, especially for scholarships. We have only one endowed chair in the uh, medical school. It is the Carl Wegner chair. Um, so we and, know that individuals. Uh, uh, funded by um, our uh, 
famous alumni to my left. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we do get um, uh, some funding. We try very hard. Scholarships is my big push uh, because I want our school to be both excellent and affordable. Winner, somebody said, does South Dakota benefit from having a medical school? I, I, I was uh, reminded by somebody, and I can't even remember who it was, who said it was Sioux City and so Sioux Falls, neck and neck, neck and neck, and suddenly we had a four-year medical school, and then right out of that came huge changes to our state and to Sioux Falls, and that, our, that the, the, the city of Sioux Falls developed this crackerjack, top-notch medical center. Uh, really the two, the two uh, 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 businesses, the two hospitals, and the, the, the energy that generated from the medical school being in our city and in our state is just immense. I mean, how much does the state of South Dakota benefit? And I would add, Carl, what do you think? You, you sold this two-year school to a four-year school because you said it was going to benefit the state. Yes, that was a, a, one of the principles upon which we were so enthusiastic to implement. Uh, and I think to a large extent that has happened that there are many uh, uh, physicians in South Dakota now who were not here before, but uh, uh, it, uh, Sioux Falls and Rapid City have, have uh, uh, perhaps gotten more than our fair share. We have so many uh, uh, fully trained physicians now, residency trained, and donating teaching time to the medical school. There's just no, uh, uh, no end to it. Uh, I wanted, you brought this uh, yes. uh, placard uh -huh. from uh, your um, wall, South Dakota. Th these were, what were these, bumper stickers that these you were? These were bumper stickers in 1973 and se early 74. The medical students put those out and uh, applied them to bumpers all over the state. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, but a huge benefit for the state. But the biggest benefit is that our kids uh, have an entry uh, to, to, uh, to medicine. Yes, and that entry was really threatened at this point. Excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, no, 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 please. Uh, and, and the, and the four-year school was opening for that. Yes, yes. Uh huh. The two-year school was going to be done. I mean, it, 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 we couldn't have continued too much longer. Yes, right? it was a problem uh, uh, every year trying to uh, uh, get the students transferred. I think finally that last year we wound up with when I became dean. We still in the mid late in the summer we still had forty percent of our of our two-year class wow. that was not in, involved. I spent days and nights calling everybody I could think of and the deans of all of the medical schools, some of whom were very accommodating and some of whom got a little tired of me. <laughs> <laughs> so it, thank goodness we we, we... we finally got every, uh, all transferred toward the, at the end of the, at the end of the year, except for three. Three had to just sit out for a year, and then we worked on getting them transferred the following year, which they did. But it was a, it was difficult for them to sit yeah. out a year. Yeah, you bet it was. Well, and, and we're actually working to um, we have proposed expansion of the medical school um, mm -hmm. through the governor's primary care task force and, and um, with the permission of board of regents, and we'll see where that fares. But um, I strongly agree with you. I think all qualified South Dakota. Um, students who want to become doctors. You know, I think we should be taking the majority of, we do take the majority of them, but um, I, I think that that's an important thing. And uh, so we're, we're working for that as well. Great. Well, we'll be back right after this. When you were born, I couldn't wait till we could hunt together. You taught me a lot, Dad. Hope we have many more years. Did you do it yet? What? You're talking about that colon thing again, aren't you? You really need to get screened. We have colon cancer in our family, and if they catch it early, it's treatable. At least do a stool test. Oh, jeez. Dad, it could save your life. We could keep hunting together. All right, I'll call on Monday. Why, while I was in college and at a pre-med club meeting, plans were made to invite a speaker to tell us what is required for getting into medical school. Well, guess who volunteered to find the expert? After calling medical, the medical school, I was connected to Dr. Carl Wegner because he was the one willing to do such a thing. I must say I've never before or since met a more gracious man. And that evening, he presented to our little pre-med group the details of applying to medical school with a helpful and thoughtful way. There I heard for the first time one of the great lecturers of my lifetime experience. 
Well, a few years later, after acceptance into medical school, I was one of a group of innocent, empty-headed sophomore students trying to absorb everything about pathology from Dr. Wagner and his wondrous crew of physician teachers. Up to that class, we had learned about normal, healthy anatomy and physiology, but, but it was in pathology we learned about the cause for each and every illness. Basically, what can go wrong in the human body? At the time, Carl Wegner was the chair of the Department of Pathology and later became the dean of the school, serving through the tough transition time when our medical school served, moved from a first two-year program to a full four-year MD degree granting school. There was some heavy lifting during that time and the people of the state of South Dakota owe a great deal to Dr. Wagner and, and other grand leaders who had the foresight to get that done. But he did it with his usual graciousness. Grace is a word that reflects not only elegance in movement, but also in kindness, politeness, and goodwill shown for others. Each of you certainly can name a few teachers that made a difference in your life. Perhaps it was one or both parents who gave you a sense of worth and a, of the value of honesty, or a third grade teacher who showed you how you can do it and how to help others, or a high school teacher who taught you toughness and not to give up, or a college professor who helped you achieve a creative and academic challenge. Dr. Carl Wegner was, and still is, a teacher who has made a big difference in my life and in many lives, teaching not only what can go wrong with the human body, but also how to face difficulty with grace. Well, we've got a couple more questions. I thought maybe we'd jump into them. Uh, please comment on hospitalists. Doesn't the patient become disconnected with their primary care doctor? And the answer is um, yes and no. Um, hospitalists were not something that somebody mandated or regulated into existence. They just happened. And they happened because outpatient practices got so busy. I remember my father walking out of a waiting room with 35 people because he had to go to the hospital. That was just not sustainable after a while. So they just happened. Continuity of care between the primary care physician and the inpatient physician, between the inpatient physician back to the primary care one, big topic of conversation now, and transitions of care as well. It is uh, a most important area, and we have not perfected it. The, the uh, questioner is quite right. No. I, I struggle with it because there's a rotating Hospitalists, of course, because they they work so hard. They I mean, they have to. Hours a day. They can't work 24 hours a day, and they the the, the continuity, and then there's a, the, the the hospitalist generally tosses to the subspecialist, and, and of course we need those subspecialists. But there is so much loss of continuity. When you've got a primary care guy or gal, you have the continuity, but you may not have that special uh, knowledge. So there's the problem. Mm -hmm. Carl, have you thought about that? Uh, yes, but first I want to thank you for so much for those kind words. I remember so well here in class, you sat about where the door is, yeah. off to my right a little, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all year long. Now, what about uh, well, yeah, the, the hospitalist? The, do you, you know, do you, uh, I feel like there's a loss of continuity. Well, it certainly changed. Uh, uh, oh, I'm just told that we're, I'm sorry. We got to wrap this up. We're running you, out of you time. You go right ahead, please. please. Uh, uh, You're so gracious. I would just be, be rambling. <laughs> this brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our studio guests and very good friends, Dean Carl Wagner and Dean Mary Nettleman, for helping to answer all of the insightful questions from our audience. Not all of them. We've got some more. Ten-time NCAA basketball championship winning coach John Wooden noted, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people.
is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.